Okay, let's deal with uh, inhibition. So inhibitors are uh, chemicals usually. These are chemicals that slow reactions down. And they're uh, effectively, there are two sorts and uh, type one that we're going to deal with is competitive. So just going back to um, our little Pac-Man, which is in my opinion the easiest way to draw an enzyme. And we've got our active site and it fits perfectly with our substrate. So here we've got our enzyme substrate complex and we're going to get then an enzyme and our product, whatever that is. A competitive inhibitor is so called because it competes with the substrate for the active site. And that means that it will kind of fit into the active site. So if you imagine something that perhaps looked a bit like that, it's not the same shape. But it's, a, it's similar enough that it will fit in. Now that will not give us a product, obviously. But what it will do is it will prevent our normal substrate from colliding as long as it's there. So then we come into sort of ratios and uh, how much inhibition you get. So if we imagine our graph with substrate concentration. And rate of reaction at the side. So normally what happens is as you increase substrate concentration, the likelihood of successful collisions goes up until all the active sites are full. If we put an inhibitor in, some of that enzyme might have um, the inhibitor in it. And if that happens, then the rate of reaction will be slowed, slowed down just because the inhibitor is sitting in the active site and the substrate can't get in. That will mean that they, at each substrate concentration there will be fewer of the, um, of the enzyme substrate complexes. But the more substrate we have, the more likely it is the substrate will get to the active site first. So the more, as we get to these really high concentrations of substrate, what we find is that with the inhibitor, although it does slow it down, eventually you'll have enough substrate in that it's pretty much the normal rate of reaction. So it all depends on how much substrate we've got compared to how much inhibitor. The more substrate we've got related to the inhibitor, the better the reaction will be going. Now, what is really important is that you don't refer to them as being the same shape. They are similar shapes. They're also not stopping the reaction happening. They're just slowing it down. You're getting fewer uh, enzyme substrate complexes forming. It's not that you're stopping anything happening whatsoever. Um, these tend to be quite reversible. There's a, quite a lot of what we call end product inhibition going on. So you can imagine that, you know, if we're um, if our reaction is just sort of taking a little slice out of this, then you know, or even if in what I've just drawn with this sort of little triangular point and it's splitting in two across there, this bit will still fit in. Now that's really, really useful in cells because what it means is that if you're doing a reaction and you've got lots and lots of end products, you don't really want to make any more or too much more, you want to make it a bit slower perhaps, this will inhibit the enzyme and slow the reaction down so that you don't make more of it, don't make more than you need. 
So really, really handy end product inhibition. And of course the end product is often quite a similar shape to uh, the substrate that you're dealing with in the first place. The other sort is called non-competitive. So this is nothing to do with it, uh, active sites. So we've got a Pac-Man. normally fits in its substrate there to give our products but remember that an enzyme is a 3D kind of thing so what we're saying is that there might be a little site somewhere here perhaps and we call this an allosteric site don't ask me what that means in which an inhibitor would bind now, the thing about allosteric sites is that when they have inhibitors bound to them, it changes the shape of the protein. So here's our allosteric site, here's our protein, and what we're saying is when that inhibitor is sitting in there, it actually messes pushes the shape of the protein out. It might disrupt some of the bonds perhaps, but it alters the shape of the active site. Perhaps not quite as dramatically as that. So, if it's altering the shape of the active site, then obviously you're going to get much less successful collisions. It's kind of artificial, it's denaturing it really realistically I suppose. So if we look at the graph then, again we're going to do the substrate concentration graph against rate of reaction. Normally no inhibitor, increase in rate, levels off at a maximum when all the active sites are full. But of course here, if we've got some inhibitor, it will alter the shape of those active sites. And therefore, those active sites are no longer available. They cannot possibly do successful collisions. So what you get is a graph that goes underneath. And you'll always have, you'll never be able to reach its maximum rate of reaction because you've denatured some of the enzyme and it's, it's just not working. Um, so things that work like that, so there, there are various things that we've actually heard of. We've heard of cyanide, uh, which affects one of the enzymes in respiration in the electron transport chain. Um, arsenic, mercury and lead. So here we're not talking about things that could be useful, are we? We're talking about poisons, cyanide poisoning, arsenic poisoning, mercury poisoning, lead poisonings. These tend to be heavy metal things. Um, not that heavy metal's bad, it's a good genre of music, but perhaps not so good if we're talking about heavy metal ions with your enzymes. Um, so yeah, pretty bad and they're, they're making permanent alterations to the shapes of active sites and slowing down your reactions when really probably you don't want them to be slowed down unlike your competitive where they're slowing it down because you're making a lot of product that's not necessary. Okay, hope that helps.